I'm delighted that our speaker this afternoon will be Farooq Yahya, who was formerly, or he's still senior teaching fellow at SOAS, University of London, but is now attached to the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University. Farooq was assistant curator of the exhibition, The Arts of Southeast Asia from the SOAS Collections, 2014 to 2016, which was held at the Brunei Gallery, SOAS. This afternoon, he will be speaking on ancient practices involving Malay magic and divination in Southeast Asia. After the talk, we will be opening up to a Q&A, which will be moderated by Edin Ku, founder and director of Pusaka. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Farooq Yahya. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much to Rahel and Edin for inviting me today and organizing this, uh, this event today. And it is an honor to be given the opportunity to present some of my work to you today. And thank you very much today for coming. So my talk today is on Malay magic and divination as it relates to, the, as it relates to Malay manuscripts, particularly the, image, the, the images that are contained within them. First, let me explain by what we mean by Malay manuscripts. Manuscripts are texts that are written by hand because before, before printing, all documents had to be copied by hand. In the case of Malay manuscripts, they are typically made out of paper and can be found in a variety of different formats. So, for example, you can have manuscripts in the form of codex format, like a normal modern book, like that example here. Or they can be found in the form of folding books, like this one here, or as single sheets of paper, such as letters, as well as scrolls. The texts contained in these manuscripts cover a broad range of topics, including religion, histories, legends, poetry, legal codes, medicine, and correspondence. Up to the earlier 20th century, they were usually written in a form of Arabic script known as Jawi, which is read from right to left. In terms of date, the majority of surviving Malay manuscripts or indeed Southeast Asian manuscripts in general, date from the late 18th century, i.e. the 1700s, to the early 20th century or the early 1900s. There are a few which are older than that, but they are fairly rare. This is because, unfortunately, the hot and humid climate of the region, coupled with the perishable nature of the material from which they are made, means that early manuscripts in Southeast Asia have generally not survived. So we do not know when books were first produced in the region or what texts and images they might have contained. Nevertheless, the Malay manuscript tradition appears to be a long-standing one with ancient origins, although there are still many facets that have yet to be explored. Magic, magic and divination are two topics that are found in the manuscripts. Now, what do we mean by magic and divination? The, the definitions for magic and divination are very complex, but basically magic, to quote from Professor Emily Savage-Smith from Oxford, is an act that seeks to alter the course of events, usually by calling upon a superhuman force, most often God or one of his intercessors. And divination are uh, attempts to predict future events or gain information about things unseen, but not necessarily to alter them. So as such, magic covers things like spells, incantations, amulets, talismans, and sorcery, while divination includes things like numerology, astrology, interpretation of dreams or omens, and lot casting. We find many of these topics discussed within Malay manuscripts. These manuscripts are compiled and used by magicians, or in Malay, Bomohan Pawang, as well as other practitioners of magic for their work. Note that the compilers and users of these manuscripts need not necessarily be professional magicians, but might also include other members of society, such as religious officials and literate laypersons, as we shall see later. Information about how these books were used over the centuries is sparse, 
but literary sources provide a glimpse of their usage. One of the most interesting descriptions of these manuscripts appears in the Hikayat Hang Tua, or the Epic of Hang Tua, set in 15th century Malacca, but probably composed in Johor sometime between 1688 and 1710s. In the tale, the protagonist, Hang Tua, is shown to have consulted his magical handbook, referred to in the text as Pustaka, in a number of adventures. In one of the most memorable episodes of the story, in which he captures the princess Tunteja for the Sultan of Malacca, Hang Tua uses his book, Tongkong Kot, a love potion, Guna Pengase, to gain her affections. And once she had been delivered to the ruler, finds a spell from the book to make her hate him, referred to as Hikmat Pembenci. What is significant about the Malay corpus of Malay magic and divination manuscripts is that many of them also contain images such as illustrations of human beings, animals, spirits, plants, objects, diagrams, charts, and talismanic designs. They are therefore very important not only for informing us about the Malay belief system and cosmology, but also for our understanding of Malay art. The illustrations are referred to within the manuscripts by the term Pata or Gamba. So Pata in the modern Malay sense means map, but the original meaning is illustration. Typically, the drawings and paintings of living beings and objects are schematic, two-dimensional with a lack of depth, and are not usually anatomic anatomically accurate or realistic. The figures are often without much movement or expression, and even when action is depicted, they still come across as being fairly stiff. In most cases, the figures are depicted singly, without any background or landscape elements, and often without frames. A prominent subject matter in the manuscripts comprises illustrations of human beings and spirits. In many cases, spirits are depicted in an anthropomorphic or human form. They appear in both magical and divinatory contexts, for example, as the models for effigies to be used in sorcery and love magic, or as divinatory tools. The ways in which anthropomorphic figures are depicted within the manuscripts vary. They may range from simple schematic stick figures, such as in this diagram here, to those that are more fully formed with detailed anatomical features and costume. Um, the diagram on the left is uh, a divinatory chart uh, diagram called the Raja Mukha diagram. So here, oops, I don't know where you can see. So basically, you, you count around the diagram, and if you reach the one without the head, then you will lose, and if you get the ones with the head, then you will win. The one, the one on the right-hand side is um, a divinatory technique called the Victorial Falname. So it's basically a divinatory book where each opening has an image on one page and a text, the prediction on the opposite page. So you open the book at random, and you see what image you come across, and then the text will say, this image mean, is some so-and-so, and it means that your fortune will either be good or bad. This manuscript here is in the Soas, Soas collections, and was copied in Kotobaru Klantan, and is datable to the 19th century. It was copied by a person named Haji San Lundang, who had copied it for a certain Tuan Bilal Haji Yusuf. This person, Tuan Bilal Haji Yusuf, is referred to within the manuscript as a Bilal or Muezzin of a mosque named Masjid Raja, which literally means royal mosque. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to locate uh, which one is Masjid Raja exactly. The manuscript was presented to Suez by Sir Richard, Richard Winstead. Oops. So the manuscript, sorry. The manuscript comes from, in case you're not familiar, comes from Klantan here. So Richard Winstead was born and educated in Oxford 
and first came to the Malay Peninsula in 1902 as part of the civil service, spending his first 10 years in Perak and much of the following 15 years in Singapore, where he was involved in the educational systems of both Malaysia and Singapore. Upon retirement from the Malayan civil service, he took up a position at SOAS, where he taught Malay for about 10 years, as well as becoming a member of the SOAS governing board. The manuscript contains a number of human figures. This is a figure for divination through breathing. According to the text in the manuscript, the right and left nostrils are associated with certain figures. On the right, you have the Prophet Muhammad and his four companions or caliphs. On the left, his daughter and the four archangels. Thus, for instance, the caliph Abu Bakr is on the bottom of the right nostril. So if you want to know if you can cross the river without a boat, breathe through Abu Bakr's passage, i.e. the bottom of the right nostril. If it feels heavy, then we cannot cross the river as the water is deep, and if you feel light, then it's okay. This illustration here is a pictorial representation of this technique. So, so this circle on the right represents the right nostril. Uh, so this would be the right nostril, and within it are the names of Prophet Muhammad and the four companions. And can you hear me? Yes. And on the left, this is the left nostril, we have the Prophet's daughters, Fatima, and the four archangel, Gabriel, Israel, and so on. Um, so, it's quite interesting that even though it's supposed to depict the nostrils, it's not actually located on the face of the figure, but sort of Victoria represented in the middle of his chest. And, um, and I'm not sure what exactly this protuberant, this bit represents. So I haven't figured it out yet. It might just be decoration, but. Now these images are used to bind or harm other people using the effigies. Here, the purpose is actually for defense rather than attack, as it is to stop people from causing us harm. According to one method, while defecating, the user draws the figure of the intended victim on the ground using his big toe. He then stands on the shoulders of the image and defecates onto his chest and urinates into his mouth while reciting I defecate on the person's chest, I urinate in the person's mouth. And this is to be done for seven days. Another method is to draw the image. In the text, the image is referred to as Rupa, using the toe on the ground in the fork of a road. The user then turns around on the image's navel with the heel and says, I twist that person's heart. Using a stick, he then stabs the heart and beats the image while reciting an incantation. And this is to be done three times a day. This practice of using human images for magical rituals has been known in Malay culture for centuries. It is mentioned in a stone inscription found in Palembang in South Sumatra. So Palembang is here which dates to the Srivijayan period in the 7th century. This stone with seven Naga heads, you can see, see the Naga heads above it, was commissioned by a king called Sri Jayanasha. It was used for Srivijayan subjects to take an oath of allegiance to their ruler. The text is written in the old Malay language using an Indic Southern Brahmi script and water poured over the stone would run against the text and is collected under the spout to be drunk by the subjects to show their loyalty to the ruler. The text promises rewards to obedient subjects, but was also designed to threaten those who might rebel, as failure to abide by the oath would cause suffering to the transgressor. Some of the practices described in the text would still be recognizable to us today. A major concern in the text is the practice of mind control, 
whereby a rebel could subjugate another to her or his will by making them crazy, referred to in the inscription as Makagila or Makalanyit, using herbs or magical techniques. This is said to include the use of sympathetic magic in the form of images, referred to in the, in the inscription as Rupa, spells, mantra, or love filters, kasihan. Other uses of magic include making people sick, marvuat sakit. Returning to the Soas manuscript, the illustrations tend to conform to a basic visual representation or iconography, a single, naked, human or human-like figure, usually male, shown in the frontal position with both legs apart and arms on the side. We find similar figures in other magic and divination manuscripts. For example, we can compare it with this drawing from a manuscript in the National Library of Malaysia, which is used to cure menstrual cramps or sengugut. The image is of a de the demon causing the illness. You draw the figure onto a white bowl, add water, and then the patient drinks it. Again, the figure is shown in the frontal position with both legs apart and arms on the side. In both manuscripts, the heads of the figures have a peak in the middle and sort of wings, curvy wings, on the side of the head, sort of resembling a headdress or a crown. In fact, we find other human or humanoid figures with similar head decoration in many Malay magic and divination manuscripts. My belief is that this motif is derived from a broader pre-Islamic Southeast Asian magical tradition where it formed part of royal dress used to depict powerful beings and personages, which over time became stylized and their meanings forgotten. Indeed, talismanic designs containing depictions of powerful people, deities and spirits wearing court dress can be found in other parts of Southeast Asia. For instance, in a Burmese palm leaf manuscript in the Soas collection, we can see images of spirits to be used for protective tattoos. On the right is, is an amulet from Cambodia depicting the Hindu god Vishnu and is used to protect a newborn child from spells and witchcraft. Like the Malay figures, they're shown in the frontal view and wear headdresses with peaks in the middle and sort of wings on the side. Um, in fact, if you notice this figure, this Burmese figure has sort of epaulets on the shoulders, this curved epaulets, which you also find in sort of Thai, if you watch Thai dramas, Thai dance dramas, traditional dance dramas, they also, the costumes have epaulets on the side. And if you notice, the Malay figure also has these sort of uh, wings, epaulets on the shoulders which I believe is part of traditional court royal deaths centuries ago. Magic and divination manuscripts also provide information on other matters, such as how to determine the auspiciousness of a new house or to identify a good time for traveling. Many of these can be traced to the Indian tradition. Indian architectural treatises, known as Vastu Shastra or Shilpa Shastra, deal with aspects such as selecting the appropriate sites and the types of buildings to be built. These texts can be found in various South Asian languages, such as Sanskrit, Tamil, Sinhalese, and Malayalam. These South Asian texts often provide a number of mathematical formula to be used to determine whether the measurements of a building are of the correct proportion in terms of whether it will be auspicious or not. One of the calculations that need to be taken into account is called the yoni, or origin. This is calculated by multiplying the width or area by three, and then dividing the result by eight. The remainder number is then linked to one of the cardinal directions and to an animal or object which is either auspicious or inauspicious. An example could be seen in the classical Sanskrit work, the Mayamata, from the Tamil region, datable to the 11th century. According to the text, 
on building a house, you, the yoni is calculated by multiplying the width by 3, and then the result is divided by 8. The resulting remaining number is then linked to one of these objects or animals. So if you get a number, remain the number 1, then it's the standard or the flag. If you get 2, then it's the cloud, 3 the lion, 4 is the dog, uh, 5 is the bull, 6 is donkey, 7 elephant, and 8 crow. Those with an odd remainder number, 1, 3, 5, and 7, are considered auspicious, whereas those with an even number are inauspicious. In Malay architecture, a similar sequence of animals is also used to determine the auspiciousness of a new house. The method of calculation follows the same formula, but goes around it in a slightly different way. This method is given in the Tajul Muluk, a popular Mal Malay manual for magical and divinatory techniques that was compiled by an Archinesh Sheikh Ismail ibn Abdul Muttalib al-Ashi in Mecca sometime during the 1880s. Here, the unit of measurement is the dapa, which is the length of the outstretched arms of the owner or mistress of the house. This is measured using a piece of string. The string is then divided into three. One-third of it is discarded, keep the remaining two-thirds. The two-thirds is then folded into eight. Seven-eighths are discarded, and you keep the remaining one-eighth to count of the length of the bundle or the threshold of the house. Using a similar list of animals and objects to those in the Indian sources, and they are the naga, serpent, the smoke, asap, lion, dog, and so on. If we compare the two systems, we can see in the Malay system the flag has been replaced with the naga serpent, and a cloud with smoke, but everything else is exactly the same. As before, odd numbers are auspicious, while even numbers are not. The similarities in the method of calculation and the list of animals and objects indicate that the Malay text has its roots within the Indian architectural tradition. Also in the Indian tradition, an alternative group of animals for the yoni calculation is also found. According to a Tamil technical treatise, the yoni is calculated by taking the area of the house length times width, multiplying it by three, and then dividing the figure by eight. The animals associated with the remainder numbers are slightly different. So you get the Garuda instead of the standard or the flag. You get the cat instead of the cloud. Lion is the same, dog is the same. You get serpent instead of bull, you get the rat instead of the donkey, uh, elephants the same, and you have the hare instead of the crow. When arranged and around the compass, we can see that the animals are placed so that those that are antagonistic to each other are on the opposite sides. So, so you have the cat opposite the rat and the hare opposite the dog. This affects traveling from the house. For example, a person living in the position of the Garuda must not travel towards the serpent and vice versa. In Malay magic and divination manuscripts, a similar group of eight animals are found. But the Malay versions tend to provide seven sets of compasses, one for each of the seven days of the week. They appear, for instance, in a treatise on bull and buffalo fighting from Kelantan or Patani, datable to the mid-19th century. According to a dedication contained within it, the manuscript was produced for a prince or Rajamuda of Kelantan. The eight animals are used not for house building, but to determine the correct direction in which to lead a bull or a buffalo in and out of its pen on different days of the week. Here, the animals are similar. You have the cat and the dog
cat, cat and the rat, um, elephant and lion, naga and garuda. And, but instead of the hare and the dog, you have the tiger and the cow. Um, okay, so just to clarify, so these are for four days of the week. So this one's for Monday, that's for Tuesday, that's for Thursday, and that's for Friday. It is interesting to see how the animals are depicted in the drawings within this manuscript. So, uh, let's look at this one here, it's a bit clearer. So, you have the cat and the rat, which are supposed to be these two, but it's very hard to tell which one's the cat and which one's the rat. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you have, this I think it's supposed to be the cow, but it's got, sort of antlers, so it looks more like a, like a deer rather than a cow. Um, the Naga serpent is the mythical serpent um, in Malay, derives from Indian tradition. In Malay examples, they tend to be look more like a Chinese dragon but without legs. Um, the elephant here, you know this called got a howdah, which is the platform for people to sit on behind it. So it shows that it's being depicted as a domesticated animal rather than a wild elephant. And this one is supposed to be the lion. So you know this has got an elephant's trunk, uh, horns, and wings. <coughs> so because the, the lion is not a native species of the region. So it's in, in Malay and Southeast Asian art in general it tends to take on a very fantastical uh, imagery. And you might want to look at how the fur and the feathers and the scales are being depicted here. So the fur used to depict as straight lines. Uh, the structure of the tiger has sort of curved around it. Um, and so on inside the feathers. Similar composites of eight animals are also found in manuscripts from other parts of Southeast Asia. This is a manuscript probably from Laos or possibly Thailand or Myanmar, and again you have eight animals around it. So, so you have similar group of animals. Uh, I haven't been able to decipher the text, but I think that should, that might be the Garuda against the Naga. So again, a pornography of the Naga serpent in Southeast Asia is sort of vaguely like a Chinese dragon, but without any legs. And you have uh, the cats, the cat opposite the rat, as you can see, this one you can differentiate between the two animals a bit more clearly. Uh, this one I'm not sure it's a goat or cow, but it's opposite the tiger. Uh, this looks, this would be a lion opposite the elephant. So again, the lion is, it's not very realistic, it's got tufts and sort of uh, beard. And notice how the fur is being depicted. This one has lines, the elephant has this kind of fur. Tiger sort of almost looks like scales uh, on the tiger and the lion. And this is a Bugis manuscript from Sulawesi. So again, I'm still trying to decipher the animals, but I think this might be the cat, obviously the rat. Uh, this looks like the tiger, obviously the goat. Um, this might be the eagle or the garuda opposite. I'm not sure what it is. It might be the banyan tree. Uh, but the two sets, this one set of animals is different. You had the crocodile opposite the fish. So this type of compass diagrams of eight animals can be found across Southeast Asian societies, regardless of languages or religion, indicating a shared heritage. Now in the Bugis manuscript, on the right-hand side, it's a, it's a colored, uh, multicolored five by five table. This is a divinatory technique used to determine auspicious or inauspicious times. This technique is known in Malay as the Katika Lima or five times. In the Katika Lima method, within a five day cycle, each day is divided into five time periods. These are morning, forenoon, noon, afternoon and evening. Each time period during the day is presided over by a Hindu god 
and these gods rotate the positions over a cycle of five days. Each god determines the outcomes of events and actions during that period, i.e. whether that time is auspicious or otherwise. Within the system, the five gods are Maswara or Maishwara, which is another name for Shiva, Kala, Sri, Brahma, and Vishnu, i.e. Vishnu. Apart from in Malay manuscripts, the Katikalima system has also been found in other parts of Southeast Asia, such as in Java, Sulawesi, and the Philippines. Within the Malay manuscripts, the cycle of the Katikalima is usually shown as a table. At its most basic form, the table will have five cells in each row and column. The first row contains the five time periods or the five katika for the first day, the second row for the second day, and so on. The cycle begins on the first day of the month. So occasionally you find an upward facing crescent moon depicting the start of a new month. Uh, if you remember, the Malay text is written from right to left. So you start from left to right to left. In this example, on the first day, the watch or ruling power in the morning is Maishwara, forenoon is Kala, noon is Sri, afternoon Brahma, evening and Vishnu. On the second day, they rotate the position, so the last one becomes the first one the next day. So Vishnu now becomes the first one on the second day, Maishwara now the second one, uh, Kala, Sri and Brahma and so on. And this cycle is repeated over the cycle of five days. At the sixth day, then it reverts back to as it is on day one. There are texts that accompany these tables that describe the influence of each god on events or actions that are carried out during the time period it is presiding over. Each god is either of a positive or negative nature and thus affects the actions that are carried out during their watch accordingly. So Maishwara and Sri are good, but Kala, Brahma and Vishnu are bad. Therefore, for things that happen during the species of Maishwara and Sri, the outcome will be good, while those that happen during the other three, the outcome will be bad. For example, under Maishwara, it will be a good time to have an audience with the king, and bad news will turn out to be not so bad after all. On the other hand, time periods under Kala are bad, so do not see the king during those times, and any bad news you receive will actually really be bad. Another way the gods affect actions is by the colors. Each god is associated with a particular color. For Mashwara, it's white yellow, Sri is white, Kala is black, Brahma is red, and Vishnu is green. These colors play a major influence on the outcomes. For example, the color associated with Brahma is red. Therefore, if you are invited by someone for a meal, the food to us will be red such as meat or red-colored sweets. If our belongings are stolen, the thief will have red skin or red hair. And illnesses that occur during that period will be cured with red-colored medicine. The association of colors with the gods are sometimes depicted visually within the manuscripts. The colors may be painted into the cells where, where you might find the whole cell being colored in such as in this manuscript, which was collected by Stanford Raffles, probably originating from Selang or datable to the late 18th century. Or you might find the cells being split half and half with the names um, and in one half and the colors in the, the other half. Occasionally, the colors used might not be accurate, but rather an approximation. For instance, here in this manuscript in, in the National Library uh, from Trunganu dated 1877-78, the red of Brahma is, used, is purple is used instead of red, probably because the, the artist didn't have red ink, possibly. Or, or, but anyway, it's an approximation. A few tables have gone on a step further by adding decorative elements to the tables. In this manuscript, probably from Patani, datable to 19th century, now in the National Library of Malaysia, an arch motif of red, white, and yellow has been added around the three sides of the table. 
it's shaped as an interlocking wave motif here. So it sort of interlocks. It's sort of like a wave which is interlocking. In her study of illuminated Malay manuscripts from the east coast of the Malay Peninsula, Animal Gallup has identified this, ident this interlocking wave motif to be one of the main characteristics of the Patani style of manuscript illumination, such as in this Quran. This strongly suggests that this Katika Lima manuscript was produced in the Patani area as well. I don't know if you can see, um, so this is the interlocking wave motif in this Quran, which is very similar to this one here. Finally, another Malay divinatory technique makes use of a circular or a wheel diagram. This technique is known as the Fa'al Quran or divination by the Quran. It is a form of bibliomancy, that is, divination using books. We find the use of books for divination in many cultures. In the Christian tradition, people use the Bible. In the Islamic tradition, they use Quran, which is the sacred text for Muslims. Um, it is the simplest form of bibliomancy is that you open the book at random and you see what the first word you come across in that predicts what your fortune is. Um, but over time, more complex techniques are have been developed to, to obtain divinatory uh, prognostications. Some use diagrams such as in this file Quran, which is from Malacca, dated 1913. So Malacca is there. It was copied by a school teacher named Ahmad bin Jaidin from another manuscript that belonged to his father, who was also a school teacher. Uh, not much is known about Ahmad bin Jaidin, whether he was also a practicing magician or not, but it shows that, it, but he was a school teacher, so it shows that you know, the use of these manuscripts need not necessarily be the domain of professional Bomo or Pawang. Here, the wheel diagram contains Quranic verses and the 99 names of God. So, Quranic verses in the center circle and the names of God on the outside. These questions can be found in a separate concordance table, which is, um, which is linked to the wheel by, by the 99 names of God. So, questions are here. So this is a separate table. So you have the questions which you want to ask here. And these, these questions are linked to the real diagram using the 99 names of God here. So for example, question 17, which is there, will the sick person be cured, relates to the name Malik al -Mul Ya Karim, which is the, the owner of all sovereignty or, and all generous. Using this, you then find the name of God that relates to your question within the wheel. So that will be there. And then you choose a number randomly between 1 and 10. Using this number, you then count clockwise around it to reach another sector. For instance, if you choose 6, then you count 6 places to reach the 22nd sector. And that contains this a Quranic verse from chapter 33, verse 35. Now, each Quranic verse is, linked, is then linked to a set of 10 responses each on the other pages of the manuscript. So these are the names of the Quranic verses, and each one has a list of 10 possible answers. So in our example just now, if we chose number six, then you count along, you get this running first, and then using the same number, which is six, then count down to get this answer here. According to the answer to the question, will the sick person be cured, is that the, per the patient will recover. The Fal Quran appears to have been based on Persian models as a similar divinatory procedure is also found in Persian manuscripts. An example is in this Persian manuscript dated 1480. Here, the text is accompanied by two wheel diagrams. So the one at the top contains the um, titles of the chapters from the Quran, 
and the inner ring contains the questions that you want to ask. The one at the bottom is the list of numbers 1 to 15 which you're supposed to choose at random. In terms of the structure of the procedure, the Fa'al Qur'an belongs to a system of lot divination found throughout Europe and the Islamic world which have a fixed set of questions and a fixed set of answers to each question. Now, there are many variants to this type of divination around the world. Within the Islamic world, this form of lot divination is known as the lots of al Ma'mun, named after the 9th century Abbasid Caliph al Ma'mun, who had a keen interest in astrology. So it's this one here. There are similar divinatory procedures in the West, such as the lots of King Socrates. Ultimately, this system of lot divination originates in the Greek or Roman world. As can be seen in a text known as the Lots of Astramsicus, datable to the late 1st and early 10th, 3rd century, of which several Greek papyri from Egypt survive. Again, in all these techniques, you have a fixed set of questions and fixed set of answers, which you choose via a random number. You usually choose between 1 to 10 or 1 to 15 and then you have to go through various loops and obstacles to reach your answer. One question that we could ask about the Fal Quran and its many variants is why the wheel form was adopted for this divinatory technique. Now, the association between circle and human fate is an ancient and widespread one, perhaps the most famous example being the Wheel of Fortune. Now, in the Wheel of Fortune, you have images of four kings. So the one at the top is all really dressed up. It looks very kingly, whereas the bottom is sort of semi-naked. So it shows the various you know, fortunes of man. However, in the case of the Fal Quran, it seems more likely that the use of the wheel diagram in this form of divination was derived from scientific models. In the medieval Western Islamic traditions, the wheel was especially popular in astronomical, cosmographical, and calendrical works, such as in this horoscope for, uh, uh, for a prince named Iskandar Sultan. You can see it's, it's shaped in a circular form. At the same time, the usage of the wheel form also has practical considerations. Diagrams help text to be presented in an efficient manner, and such the wheel could be divided into concentric circles, which means that multiple sets of text, like the list of questions and Quranic verses could be written jointly. The circular shape also means that all the sectors could be joined continuously without an end, and thus a person could move from the final sector to the first one without breaking the count. Furthermore, the diagram could be read from any direction and looked at from many different angles. And this leads to the question of whether multiple people could use the same diagram at once. In Renaissance Europe, these divinatory devices were often used for social entertainment as a form of party game. Uh, so this situation uh, from Italy, 16th century, you see these people hanging around uh, this, this, this book, this block book, you can see a real diagram here, and these are the dice which you use to generate the random block. <coughs> However, it is unclear if this form of divination and accompanying wheel diagrams were similarly used as a party game within the Islamic world. To conclude, Malay magic and divination manuscripts can tell us a lot about various aspects of Malay society. It informs us about the Malay belief system and cosmology, such as what type of supernatural entities uh, that inhabit this world, such as the Sungugu demon here, and by looking at the predictions for divination, we can learn about the concerns of the people. For example, we often find many questions about traveling, marriage, illnesses, going into business, and so on. It can also tell us a lot about Malay drawing and painting, from technical aspects, such as how images are drawn, to questions relating to how and why images are depicted the way they are. Furthermore, Many of the techniques and images described within the manuscripts are shared with other societies, both Islamic and non-Islamic, not only within Southeast Asia, but also the wider world. 
This demonstrates that the literary and artistic tradition of Malay magic and divination did not exist in isolation, but was part of an extensive and long-running transmission of ideas and knowledge between many cultures. All of this reflects a very complex system of which there's still much to be learned and which form part of my ongoing research. Do let me know if you have any questions and if you want to find more, you can have a look at these various publications. Um, this is my book which is based on my PhD thesis where I looked at around almost 100 Malay magic and divination manuscripts from various collections in the UK, Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, the second one is a catalog of an exhibition which I was helping at the Ashmolean Museum which opened last year until, and ended in January this year about the use of divination and amulets across the Islamic world. And on the right is the catalog which you find outside on um, various parts of, various types of Southeast Asian arts as found, as, as found in the SOAS collection which is part of an exhibition I worked on at SOAS. And in, 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 it contains a section of magic and divination as well. And also I'll be giving a number of talks in KL and Penang over the next few weeks if you're interested in attending. I'll be talking at UKM on Wednesday, Royal Museum uh, on Thursday, and we'll have a book launch and talk in Penang as part of the Georgetown Festival on 29th of July. Uh, just before I finish, I just wanted to point out that in case you're wondering about the image on the Facebook page, uh, sorry, this one here. Uh, so this is a scene of, from Balinese painting of the Ramayana. And I chose this image as covered book because it's a common uh, story across all of Southeast Asia. In case you don't know about the Ramayana, it's basically a, an Indian story, uh, originated from this Hindu story of Prince Rama who was exiled from his kingdom and he was banished, went to exile with his wife Sita and his brother Lakshmana. And his wife Sita was abducted by the demon king Ravana. So Rama, his brother Lakshmana, and the army of monkeys, including Hanuman, have to go and rescue her. Now, when they were in exile, how Sita got kidnapped, uh, this is a Burmese painting. So basically, Rama and Lakshmana went out hunting. So before they left, uh, so Lakshmana made a protective circle around Sita. So he basically tells Sita, don't go out of the circle. But unfortunately, she then goes out of the circle and gets, gets kidnapped. So one of the, um, one of the Malay talismanic designs, which you can find an example here, the name of this is Barisan Lakshmana, which is Lakshmana's line. So it refers, it refers back to the Ramayana story. So it shows that um, many of these Malay talismanic di diagrams, designs, have names associated with powerful figures. So here you have Lakshmana, you also have Solomon, Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad's daughter Fatima, and so on. Um, so anyway, that's it for, for now. So do let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Oh, Farouk. Yeah. Uh, we are now like to invite Adinku to join our speaker for a Q&A session. Right there. Oh, thank you very much. Is this on? Yeah, okay. I apologize for my phone. Uh, there wasn't a warning and I forgot. Uh, I apologize to everyone. Uh, anyway, um, it's uh, absolutely fascinating. I've got a million questions, but I won't use the chair to be tyrannical. Uh, and we'll open up the questions to the floor. Yeah. Uh, but I have one uh, perhaps that can trigger off um, uh, a couple of observations. Uh, there was a wonderful Babi Hutan, I think, uh, a wild boar in the Klantan uh, um, um, Talisman. Oh. Uh, but uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, uh, you know, we, 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 our context is very literalist at the moment. So we have a, seem to have a serious problem with metaphor and symbolism. We're caught up, for example, in um, 
endless debate about Hang Tua, whether he existed, whether he didn't exist, whereas all the symbolism dies out. Uh, that can be said uh, a lot about the worldview that you are talking about. Uh, in your study of these manuscripts, um, what is your reading of an understanding of metaphor uh, in the Malay worldview? Oh, is it working? Hello? Yeah, okay. Um, that's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about it much before. Um, whether these things are literally thought of, I guess, I don't know, it's hard to say. As I said, there's many talismanic designs which, are, which, which evoke powerful figures like Laxmana and the Prophet Muhammad and so on. And because these figures have a certain power to them and they, they imbue um, the power to these designs and to these objects. So, I'm not sure how to answer that really in terms of metaphor. I mostly, I guess I focus quite a lot on the art and the images rather than the text itself. So, hmm, so I have to think about more about that. Sorry about that. So. Um, I'll open it up to the floor. Uh, questions from the floor, please. Uh, one. One. To start off with. Uh, I, th I think there's a mic. I, maybe you could you need to introduce yourself. All the formalities. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really amazing. Um, okay. I was really struck by the way that the texts were really intertextual, that they referenced, um, you know, different gods and different deities from mm -hmm. different cultures. And I was wondering how much we can learn about what that might mean for the societies at that time and mm -hmm. um, how did they view, um, you know, and it goes back to the whole metaphor situation, mm -hmm. you know, did they, were they believing in all these deities at the same time or were they just drawing on them as symbols and metaphors and um, to you know, supplement their worldview at the time? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I find studying Malay magic in relation is very fascinating. As you say, there's many um, intercultural strands within them. There's the Hindu, uh, Hindu Buddhist elements, there's the pre uh, animistic traditions, there's the Christian, uh, sorry, the, the Muslim uh, tradition as well. And um, it's, it's a very, it shows that, well, I guess Malay society is not, as I said, isolation. It's not, it's just in isolation, but continue to receive many influences uh, across the world. And um, it shows, in a way, it shows connections because you can sort of relate. It's not something which I've looked into detail, but it sort of relates to how intercultural tr transmission of knowledge. So we often talk about inter interconnectedness with other parts of the world through trade and politics, but I believe that magic and divination is another way in which you can examine these kind of relationships, um, which might not be so obvious uh, through, other, through other types of evidence. And as well, it's not just the text, not just the beliefs, but also the images. Um, I find in my studies quite a lot of uh, Malay art, not just manuscript painting, but other forms of art, also have lots of Chinese influences, which I find fa fascinating, including the Naga um, figure. So again, that, that's something which we need to explore, which we might not be so obvious uh, when you look at text or historical documents. And as well, another thing I found fascinating is the interconnectedness between Malay society in terms of the rest of Southeast Asian nations. There are many similarities in terms of belief systems and um, which begs the point, you know, how, how these things work. If you're, um, there's, there's a sort of underlying layer of belief within that, but also in terms of intercultural transmission of knowledge, how, how it might have worked, I mean, with, how would they have learned these, these traditions from other cultures? That's, that's very interesting. And um, so I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Um, okay, let's see on this side. Yeah. Aja. 
would you say that the Malay is mainly enemies or, or Hindu or uh, Muslim from the divination, their divination techniques? Um, that's, that's, I would say the Malays, when they were making these manuscripts from the 18th, the early 20th century, were definitely Muslims. I mean, they identified themselves as Muslims, and many of these um, techniques, you evoke God, um, you ask God for help, it's always to do with, um, there's many Quranic verses in there, ultimately, you're asking God for help to protect you, to, um, to help you make decisions, and so on. Um, in terms of some of these um, names of deities, I guess there might be a throwback to earlier periods, but when these manuscripts were produced, they're definitely Muslims, and they were practicing Muslims at that point. Yeah. Is that? I mean, they are practicing Muslims, yeah. but in their, in their practice, they practice a lot of animism, um, I, guess, I guess there's still a lot of belief in the spirit world, which is not contradictory to Islam, because in Islam you have jinn and so on. And so, in a way, there's always spirits going around. So that's um, it's a term of supernatural. I mean, there's a supernatural world around us. And so there's still, and there's very much of the Malay worldview at that time. So. Okay, um, on this side. Anyone on this side? No. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. On this side. Uh, hi, my name is Min. I um, would like to ask a few questions. First is with regards to the depicting picture that you had just now, yeah. where you have uh, the Naga and so on, uh -huh. on four days. Yeah. Is there a certain reason why it's only four days, or is it uh, a missing text? Uh, it's, uh, I haven't showed the rest of the, th the other three days, but it's a uh -huh. seven day. Uh, oh. System. So I only showed the one for the four days because that's that's how many I can fit within the, the <laughs> okay, PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. So. Now it's interesting to see that uh, actually you have found not only that um, the Malay uh, not just relates to the Muslim but yeah. also to the uh, Hindus and also yeah. the the Chinese yeah. being Malay centers centering in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. uh, where actually where all these people might meet up with yeah. trade back in the as early as maybe 1800s or even yeah. further, even e earlier before. I mean, um, but how do you find, where do they draw, the, do they, is there a certain change in terms of uh, narration of the story, whether being a Muslim or when the, before being a Muslim, is there a change in, in, in within time uh, from, from that aspect? Um, I guess, I mean, I guess, well, Islam came to Southeast Asia around the 14th century. Well, even earlier than that, sorry, 13th, 13th century in Aceh and then spread throughout the region. Uh, but before that, uh, most of Southeast Asia was Hindu and Buddhist. So um, in terms of change, I guess you still see uh, the names of Hindu figures being mentioned in the manuscripts. As I, I showed you, the Hindu gods being mentioned. But I think um, sort of as powerful beings and figures rather than as gods per se. And, um, but yeah, I guess in some cases, in the Katikalimi system actually, it's quite interesting. The one with the five, um, you know, the, the table of five by five with the Hindu gods. One thing I found interesting is that uh, there's a similar table called the Sa'at Lima, which instead of the names of Hindu gods, you have the names of Muslim personages, Muslim prophets and angels, which I find fascinating because it shows, in a way, the names of these gods have been changed into those of Islamic uh, figures instead. Um, and some of the transpositions, like Brahma, seems to have been changed into Ibrahim. And uh, because probably because the names are sort of similar. And what's the other one? I think Sri becomes Muhammad. So I haven't really tried to figure out the correspondences between these two systems. But it's interesting to see that, you know, how with Islam, these things might have been taken into a different form. So, yeah. Someone at the back. Yeah. Hi. Hi. 
Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Noor. Um, my question is a little, well, first and foremost, the syncretism of you know, Malay magic is really interesting yep. from uh, all the various um, beliefs in the, um, in the past. But the figures that I saw reminds me of, um, I don't know whether you're familiar of uh, the Shilling Yasin. I think mm -hmm. Hugh Lowe was uh, the British um, officer, was it? Uh, Hugh Lowe was yeah. the largest collector yes. of the Shilling Yasin. Uh, but if you're not familiar, that's fine. No. My question is just whether it's magic coin or is it divination? Um, okay, yeah. so I'm not that familiar with okay. that. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to mention uh, regarding your question again about the change from uh, earlier times to to, to more Muslim uh, period, I just thought about something else. There's a technique called the rotating naga. So the naga is a, uh, a, a serpent derived from Indian tradition which lives in the ground and rotates four times a year uh, according to the cardinal direction. So three, times, uh, three months in a year it's north, it faces north and then east, west and so on. Now this technique derives from India and is found throughout Southeast Asia, not just in Malay society but in Thailand and Philippines and Java and so on. Um, and what's interesting is that, for example, if you look at the Thai version, uh, other th versions, they use the local calendars, whereas it, for the Malay version, you use the Islamic calendar. So it, the same technique with the arrival of Islam, they've changed it to more, um, to fit into the Islamic calendar, Islamic practices instead. Um, sorry, it's just the one thing I thought about. So. More? Okay, there's one at the back. Uh, hello, my name is Ayman. Hi. I was just wondering about the positioning of the animals on the charts. Uh -huh. Was there any specific reason why they were positioned in that way? Like, you know, I saw a few of the charts showing uh, showing that the elephant yeah. was on the western side. Yes. So is there any significance of it? And is it possible that the animals were drawn that way as to symbolize the, vari the supernatural variation of those animals? Um, I guess they, yeah, I mean the, the positions of animals are based on the cardinal directions. So um, certain animals are the, are on the east and the west, so there are certain um, certain uh, positions where they have to occupy. And in terms of supernatural, I guess again the lion is a sort of supernatural creature, so it's depicted in a supernatural way. Um, whereas the other animals, I think, are more uh, realistic as opposed to the lion. So. Okay, there was another on that side. Um, hello. Uh, why do we use more of the English script than the Javi script right now? Yeah. And uh, like before the Javi script, what is the script before used Javi? Uh, the script used before Javi, and how did the change happen from the earlier script to Javi? Um, before Javi, it would have been the index script, such as in this stone inscription I showed you earlier. Um, the Malay would have been written in this, uh, I think I believe it's the Southern Brahmi script, and uh, unfortunately we don't have many. Are surviving evidence of that script in terms of the Malay language available because remember these manuscripts are made of paper or palm leaf so they wouldn't survive in this in this climate most of the manuscripts are written we, most of the Malay manuscripts are found in the Jawi script this one example which is quite early I think datable to the 14th century that's still in the index script um, and the change occurred with the arrival of Islam where people started adopting the Jawi script. And um, yeah, so that's... that's that. Oh, sorry, English. And the Roman script would have been early 20th century uh, with the arrival of the British, basically. So. Is there any reason for that? Or is it just um, I guess the Roman script, I guess they felt was easier to, to read and to, to type as well and to to communicate with other uh, societies within Malaysia who might not be familiar with the Jawi script. Yeah. Okay. Over here. 
Hi, Hi. Um, my name is Vikri and I would like to thank for the talk. Okay. I have two questions actually. Yeah. Um, the first one is that uh, this talk is mainly about manuscript and yeah. written form. Yeah. And I was wondering if you have anything about like the oral or something that is a bit more like uh, on daily life. And secondly, attaching to the first question is uh -huh. that, you know, um, how does this manuscript and also the oral one is actually translated to the modern one? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, my study is mostly in manuscripts. I haven't really studied the oral tradition very much. Um, actually, my study is actually more on the images, but because I'm an art historian by training, so I looked at the images. But in order to learn about the images, you need to read the, the text to understand because they both go together. Um, and although I do talk a little bit about the orality, um, it's if you notice, if you look at these manuscripts, they're not, they don't really explain, some, some things they don't actually explain that much. So for example, with the, some of the diagrams, there's no explanation of how you're supposed to use it. So presumably, that knowledge of how to use these diagrams would have been transmitted orally. So these manuscripts might have been just eight memoirs for, you know, just to remind yourself what the texts are about. Um, on the other hand, as well, some of these texts, they, they, they were copied manuscripts. No two manuscripts are the same. I haven't found one which is exactly the same as another, which shows that possibly they were compiled, um, I don't know, uh, specifically for that person. So the person might have been just wanted that certain topic rather than the whole, copying the whole thing. Um, that said, there are certain passages which are similar to other manuscripts as well, but no two manuscripts are the same. In terms of modern, um, I'd be quite interested to see modern day manuscripts, to be honest. I know there's some people who have started to publish them, um, but it's something which I'm really interested in finding out. I know there's modern day books about um, these practices being published, which you can find in bookstores in KL, for example. So I've started to look at them uh, as well and to compare them. Some of the practices mentioned in these modern day books are quite similar to what you find in the manuscripts, to be honest, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So one at the back. Hi. Um, I was just curious, uh, when you talked about the shift from the, Rumi, from the Jawi script to the Rumi uh -huh. script, do you think that it has influenced the chasm in the Malay identity because we can no longer access knowledge that has been passed down in these manuscripts because we can't read it anymore? If you look at um, popular fiction, yeah. if you read romance novels, for example, they have a lot of references when it comes to historical novels to things that they have read in their manuscripts, but how life was like 18th century, 19th century, 17th century, mm -hmm. even during the medieval times. They have recipes. They have how, what people wear. How did they yeah. weave clothes, right? We don't have that anymore. We have this block whereby we seem to think that what we have as a people, as our culture, it only begins after colonialization comes. And we only know what is in our culture from what has been written about us by people like R.O. Winstead and so on. So do you not think that the fact that we shifted from the, Rumi, from the Jawi script to the Rumi script, we can no longer access all this knowledge that was once captured in these manuscripts? Thank you. Yeah, I guess, I guess it is a shame that many people can't read Jawi script anymore, so it's sort of um, still hidden within these, these, these old texts. Although that said, there are many attempts to transliterate them into the Roman script to make them more accessible to the public. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, but even I found when I was doing my research, it was quite difficult to read the Jawi text. When I first began my PhD, it took me a whole day to read just one page. But over time, you do get used to it. I mean, especially with magic and divination, it's very formulaic. So it's always the same pattern. The, the text would say, if something, something, then it means something, something. And you know, it just, just continues the same tradition. So, but yeah, I mean, it'd be great if more people could relearn to read the Jawi script as well, so. Got about 10 minutes, so anyone? Yeah, on that side. I'm interested to know about the depiction of 
I'm interested in the depiction of lions, mm -hmm. especially uh, as far as fossil records are known, we do not have lions in this part of the world. Yeah. So, uh, is uh, any connection with the Singapore lion mythology or the discovery of the name of Singapore? Thanks. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the lion in Southeast is not a native species in Southeast Asia. So you often find um, it's depicted as a fantastical creature, as I showed you earlier, with sort of wings and horns and so on. Um, and actually, the talk which I'm giving at UKM on Wednesday is about the calligram of the lion of Ali in Southeast Asia. So a calligram is sort of an, an image made of words. And what I found interesting in that research and this current research is that when things are transmitted from other parts of the world into Southeast Asia, the lion has been transformed into a tiger. So in my talk in, the UK, in UKM on Wednesday, I'm, the calligram of the Lion of Ali is a, sort of a, an image used in other parts of Islam, it was in the Ottoman and the, in the Persian world, where it's called the Lion of Ali because it's associated with Ali, who's known as the Lion of God. But when it comes to Southeast Asia, instead of the Lion of Ali, it's known as the Tiger of Ali. So in, in a sense, it shows how, I guess the tiger is a more common creature, it's a common predator in Southeast Asia. So it's interesting to see how one animal has been substituted to another. Any more? Okay, one there and then one there. One here and one there. Hi, hi, I'm Arif. Uh, I'm interested with the Barisan Lakshmana. Yeah. And uh, I came across a traditional house in Basut uh -huh. that have uh, the Barisan uh, Lakshmana symbol at the roof together oh, really? with the, uh, the scripts of Malay prayers in the okay. Uh, Therapy results. Okay. And my question is, how was uh, the Malay at that time negotiate between uh, practicing their adat and their Islamic uh, belief? Thank you. Um, that's very interesting. I have to look it up. And if you have any reference, please let me know. It's something I'm researching. This Barisan Lat not the motif. Um, in terms of how they associate, how they reconcile it with the Islamic belief, um, it's quite. In a way, it's, it's not as difficult as you might think because, as I said, in Islam, there's a belief in spirits uh, as well as the jinn. So, in a way, the Islamic worldview sort of corresponds to the Malay worldview as well because there's belief in spirits everywhere. On the other hand, modern science and modern medicine does not conform. It has a different worldview in terms of what causes illness and how you treat illness. And that has caused some... Um, difficulty. Um, so I hope that answers your question. So. Hi, I'm Iqmal. Hi. Yes. Uh, Iqmal. Uh, I'm wondering, um, when you study, I mean, the images uh, yeah. of this Malay magic and divination, uh, is there any difference between the East Coast and the West Coast images? I mean, uh, I'm from Kedah, so basically yeah. the West Coast, while most of the Images, I think, mostly uh, Patani, Klantan, yeah. and Tranganu, and also the Barisan Lakshmana. Yeah. So I'm just wondering whether there is a, um, a difference between East Coast, and West Coast, and also from the catalog, uh, there's mm -hmm. images from Sulu. So yeah. uh, in case there is, I mean, uh, difference. I mean, of course, the Sulu also considered as Malay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a very good question. It's something I'm investigating more. Um, I haven't come across many stylistic differences. It's something I'm trying to research more. Um, the most manuscripts which I found tend to come from the Kelantan and Patani area. I don't know whether it's because the collections which I've investigated have just have focused on those, or there might be other collections from other parts of uh, Malaysia or Indonesia which I haven't looked at. But yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, that said, there are certain similarities in terms of the iconography, the visual depiction of, of creatures. For example, human figures tend to be shown as a frontal view, um, legs apart. Sometimes you have them arms on the side. And it's something you find in other parts of Southeast Asia, including the Batak manuscripts and, and Javanese. Um, 
but yeah, again, that's, that's something I'm trying to research as well. So, yeah, Any more? Yes. Where can they be found? The Pupustaka Nagara, the National Library, has a very big collection of Malay manuscripts. And it's all very well catalogued. So if you go there to the Pusat Kebangsaan Manuscript Melayu, they'll help you. Uh, they have catalogues of their collection, which you can then refer to um, to find any manuscripts. And they always have exhibitions of manuscripts as well. The other, other collections which I looked at in KL with Islamic Arts Museum, Malaysia, they have a collection of manuscripts. Dewan Bahasa as well, uh, University Malaya as well. Um, and various museums across the country also have some collections of manuscripts. In terms of Europe, um, the SOAS, SOAS Library, um, which I investigated for my, for my research, the Royal Asiatic Society in London has a collection of Malay and Javanese manuscripts which collected by Stanford Raffles. Um, again, the libraries, the Bodleian Library and Cambridge Library in the UK. In Holland, in the Netherlands, the Leiden University Library also has a very big manuscript collection. Oh yeah, and also in Jakarta, the National Library of Jakarta as well. So. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're concluding. So let us uh, conclude with a kind of concluding question. Okay which I, I pick up gleaned mainly from the questions that are asked. I think there's a, a, a serious, con a, a real concern here of continuity mm -hmm. in the study of Malay culture. Yeah. Uh, and there was a great question earlier about whether the uh, creators of these talismans and so on saw themselves as animists, Hindus or Buddhists, uh, Hindu Buddhists or Muslims, yeah. uh, when the fact could well have been that they saw themselves as all of these things mm -hmm. <laughs> at the same time. Uh, uh, we also have not interrogated the, 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 the place and role and experience of Sufism yes, among the yes. Malays, of course, which would allow them to, to, to view the world in that kind of way. Now, the question I have for you is, you know, has the, has the introduction of classification of knowledge, you know, classification, categorization, um, been a problem uh, when studying something as you know wild and chaotic and cosmopolitan yes. as, these, as these things, um, I guess I guess you have to start by classifying things. I mean, to to able to grapple the topic, you do have to start with class being in a specific uh, specific uh, field of study. Uh, but yes, as you say, you definitely need to put it into a bigger context and put it and try to study, look at it from different angles. So as I said, I'm an art historian by training and my main interest and my main um, interest are on the images. But you need to know about the text, you need to learn about Malay literature, Malay language um, to, in order to interpret these images. At the same time, I also had to learn some anthropology, you have to look at it from an anthropological point of view as well and also a religious point of view as well. So it does help to have uh, look at things from many different angles. So that's definitely a good point, yes. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, the, the books uh, um, that you mentioned, yeah. uh, the first one I've had a, I had a look at, mm -hmm. I've not actually bought it yet, it's yeah. wonderful, though very expensive, but cheaper than a car. So, <laughs> uh, um, and I think some of them are available on that side. Uh, I think the catalog's available. Yes. The, um, the book, the catalogue of uh, the SOAS, the arts from Southeast Asia and the SOAS collections is available for sale. The book on the Malay magic and divination, I've got a couple of copies which you're welcome to have a look at, but they're not for sale. But I do have some leaflets which you can take up with you and it has a discount code as well. And I just wanted to uh, just briefly mention the catalogue Southeast Asian, also Southeast Asian collection, the SOAS collections. Um, the publication was supported by the SOAS um, Southeast Asian Art Academic Program, which is a program uh, in SOAS for the preservation and research of Hindu Buddhist art in Southeast Asia. And they provide a number of scholarships for students from Southeast Asia, including Malaysians who would be eligible to study um, this topic at SOAS at the postgraduate level. So 
I mean, I would welcome you to apply for these scholarships if you're interested. So then I have, you can ask me for details or I have some leaflets as well as you can have a look. All right, so. Thank you, Dr. Thank Farouk. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Ilham, for hosting the event.